So I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's Lung Cancer Living Room. We are so happy to be here. I'm Danielle Hicks. I'm Chief Patient Officer at GoTo for Lung Cancer, which really is just a fancy way of saying that I oversee an amazing team of people um, who help me bring to you live and in real time support programs and education such as the Lung Cancer Living Room. We are thrilled to be back in South Florida with this amazing MCI team. Dr. Reyes, I think we've been doing these living rooms down here now regionally for almost a decade. So um, thank you so much to all of you for being here tonight. For those of you who might not be familiar with this programming, it's a support and education series where we typically host it monthly. So this isn't the last time you're able to uh, sign into one of these or the third Tuesday of every month. There's some information on the table back there. But we bring to you key opinion leaders to come in and talk about varying aspects of the disease. And uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, multidisciplinary care, this multidisciplinary team here, why it's important when diagnosed with lung cancer that you have um, multiple disciplines looking at you and taking after your care. So we're thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have you. This programming is for you. So if you do have questions tonight, please feel free to raise your hand. We'll bring mics. Um, around the room to um, get those questions asked. And those of you who might be watching online, please feel free to type your questions in the chat. Uh, we do have uh, Michelle Zay, who uh, manages this program online, moderating the chat. And she'll be able to uh, make sure that we get those questions to our expert panel here. Before we get started, Dr. Rice, I think we want to do a quick patient introduction, and then we'll do a, OK. So what I'd like to ask is if you are in the room and you have been diagnosed with lung cancer, please raise your hand, tell us who you are. Um, I'm gonna hand you a mic, and then just give us your name, who you are, when you were diagnosed, um, and tell us a little bit about yourselves. So we'll start right, oh, go ahead. Hello, my name is Soledad Villanueva. Uh, I was diagnosed by lung cancer five, four years ago, four years ago, yes. <laughs> and my doctor is Dr. Rice. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Harvey. My wife, my beautiful wife's name is Fran. And uh, I've been diagnosed with stage four lung, non-small cell lung cancer. And this is, I'm in my five and a half years, thanks to Dr. Reyes. <laughs> Hi, uh, the name is Antonio Busto. I was diagnosed with cancer uh, about three years ago. Right now I'm cancer free. Uh, I have to thank Dr. Reyes and, and Dr. Castellon um, for being part of my team and thank you both very, very much and the rest of the team of uh, Memorial. Good evening, my name is Nubi Morales. I'm here with my mom, Esperanza. And I was diagnosed with lung cancer, I think it was December, end of December into January of this year. Um, I was in New York, I was living in New York, and I was told to just come here. My sister immediately put me into the system and I've been treated by Dr. Reyes. And it's been, aside from the cancer, I have to say it's been an awesome time. It's just been, I, I don't even know how to explain it, but it's been awesome. The treatment has, at the memorial has been amazing. I, 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 I don't have words. But uh, thank you so much, Dr. Reyes and everybody at memorial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer um, August 10th, 2023. 
And as of last Monday, my tumor has died. Um, so Dr. Ray's, Pola, and Ariana have been my family of angels. Mm -hmm. Love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> My mother's name is Lillian. Uh, she was diagnosed in 2012. Thank you for saving my mom. I take cancer five times. Sometimes I feel I live from here. So I say, God, not yet. I can talk to the world. Thank you, Dr. Reyes. Thank you. Bless you. Hi, good evening. My name is Melroy Brown. I've been diagnosed with lung cancer about a year now. I had my surgery in June of last year, and I started treatments in August. So I'm doing well, thank you. Dr. Domingo is my, is my oncologist, and Dr. Terrazzi, my physician, my surgeon. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Venerine Ashby. I was diagnosed in 2017, and... Um, I remember when I called, I couldn't get an appointment with Dr. Reyes because I asked my son, who should I go to? And um, he was the director at Mount Sinai, so they told him, go on Dr. Reyes. I called him back, I said, I can't get Dr. Reyes, there's no appointment. So eventually they called him and he had me in there that next day. And since then we've been family, um, was cancer free until last year when I went on a cruise and I found um, a pain in my shoulder and they found I had a list. I called Dr. Reyes and he was on me the next day. You know, he sent me and took care of me and so far I'm doing well. I hope nothing else come back, but thanks to Dr. Reyes, Dr. Castellano, we are like family. Thank you again. In Spanish. Mi nombre es Edgar Ochoa. Eh, fui diagnosticado de cáncer hace año y medio, cáncer de pulmón. Eh, afortunadamente, Dios y el doctor Rice y su, y su y maravilloso equipo humano, porque no solo son profesionales de la medicina, sino son seres humanos, y, pero fabulosos. A ellos le debo mi vida, le debo mi agradecimiento eterno. Hace aproximadamente unos seis meses me diagnosticaron también cáncer grado 3 de próstata. Y bueno, estamos tratando eh, con los medicamentos que me suministran, bueno, superar todos estos momentos difíciles, pero estamos con fe y optimismo. Creo en Dios, creo en la medicina, creo en los médicos en que Dios me puso y por eso me siento muy contento de estar esta noche con ustedes. Now, I told him to say something short so I could translate it completely, but yes, so his name is Edgar, he was diagnosed with. Um, stage four cancer a year and a half ago, but then six months ago also was diagnosed um, with prostate cancer. But you know, he said see, he's alive because the team, because the doctor, and he celebrates that they are beautiful human beings and not just in, in the medical side, not just doctors. So, and he is very thankful for that. Hi, my name is Stacy Eisdorfer, and I was diagnosed in 2019 in October. And I went in for a simple CT scan, um, a CT calcium score test, and I was worried about my heart just because I was turning 60. I wanted to make sure my heart was healthy. And the next morning I got a phone call that they found a mass on my lung. My heart is fine, all the chambers were perfect, but they found a malignancy. And that's when I had trouble getting into Dr. Reyes. <laughs> and because they said immediately, you need to call. And I called the office and I explained my situation and she said, I'm so sorry, we can't get you in, we're so busy, blah, blah, blah. Well, minutes later, 
the supervisor walked by the appointment desk and she spoke to the supervisor and she goes, today is your lucky day. Mm -hmm. They said you could come in and we made that appointment and Dr. Block went ahead and he did my surgery and Dr. Reyes treated me for stage 2B lung cancer. And I'm four years in remission and I'm doing amazing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy, and this is Kevin with me. Um, about a year ago, I had my diagnosis of stage four non-small cell lung cancer, and it truly has been like being part of a family, being treated. I feel very, very fortunate. Thank you. Hello, my name's Heidi Yoakum, and I am almost a 16-year survivor. I've had lung cancer two times, one in 2008 and another time in 2015. Dr. Block has been my surgeon both times, and Dr. Reyes is my oncologist, and I'm ALK positive. Hi, my name is Linda Radler. I was diagnosed with stage three lung cancer and I um, am doing fantastic. I just ran my 5K. I came in second place in my age group. <laughs> and thanks to Dr. Reyes and Paola and Memorial West team, I love you all. And I'm doing fantastic. Hi, I'm Judy Sharp, and in August of 2021, I was diagnosed with non smell cell lung cancer, and I am now have a new spot on my liver, but they feel good about it. They are going to take a biopsy, and I'll probably stay on immunotherapy medication, which seems to be working because most of the time I feel really good. So that's my story. My name is Magda Martinez. My doctor is Dr. Dominguez. She's there. Thank you for saying my lung cancer. I almost have only one year before, I, and I was going to be here for my small lung cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that it? Anybody else? Thank you all so much for sharing your story. Um, Again, for those of you who are not familiar with this program, this meeting um, is being broadcast live. So we aren't just bringing hope to everyone who has the benefit of being in this room, but people who might be watching from their own living rooms or those who might go back and watch post live. And I can't tell you what it means to me and what I know it means to them to hear from other people who are living with lung cancer. Um, and as we walk through and talk about whether it's been a little under a year or, or many years, um, how hopeful it can be. And by the testimony, uh, the testimonials that you all have given of this amazing team at Memorial, um, and in particular, your comments about it feeling like family is so incredibly important to me, someone who um, has a personal um, connection to lung cancer with my own mom, but who spends um, every day talking with um, uh, people diagnosed with lung cancer and their loved ones. So thank you all so, so much for sharing that. And now I am going to turn it over to Dr. Reyes and this entire team who, again, should be wearing capes um, based, on, based on some of the things um, that you guys have shared. And I'm really excited to hear you guys talk about who you are and what you do. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for the introduction. Uh, for the ones that are online that don't know us, we are Memorial Cancer Institute. Uh, we are part of the Memorial Healthcare System here in Broward County in Florida. We are the third largest uh, public healthcare system in the country because we have six hospitals here. Our, and then our mandate, because we are a, a state uh, public institution, is to take care of uh, South Broward citizens. We cover around 600,000 citizens that we need to protect. Um, and. Uh, it's a pleasure to collaborate with the GoTo Foundation. We are collaborating for more than 10 years. I had the, the honor and, uh, to, to meet uh, Daniel's mom, uh, Mrs. Bonnie Adario. Uh, she's probably watching us. And uh, 
Uh, her passion to fight this disease is uh, unique, and I thought I was very passionate until I met her, and then now uh, we, we have a lot of collaborations like this, you know, like our 5K that we do and other things. So tonight in these programs, we'd like to share and, and talk about uh, what, what is happening in lung cancer that is important for our patients. That's why we invite you tonight. And, uh, and uh, from the memorial side, I think it's, it's, it's easy because, because I'm, the five, I'm the director of the cancer center, I get all the accolades. But honestly, our, our lung cancer team is more than 40 people. You know, we meet every Monday for our tumor board. Dr. Block here is in charge of our tumor board. We are 40 people, 40 people fighting for you many specialties. We only have here eight representing, but we have many other specialists like intervention radiologists. We have our administrators in charge of the approvals and authorizations. We have, we have a lot of people that are not here, but this is an effort of our healthcare system for you. We are public, we are for the people, and that's what we do. Now we want to share briefly, because we want to also talk to you about what we do so that you can understand what is important. The topic tonight is the multidisciplinary approach. We are not going to talk specifically about any new drug. What we want is to understand that how this multidisciplinary approach that we invest in the healthcare system makes a difference in the lives of many of you, as you know. To give you an example, uh, there was a time that when the patient goes to the primary care and they found a, 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 long, a mass in the chest, it takes 90 days to see the medical oncologist, 90 days. So this cannot happen anymore. You know, you, you don't want to, Dr. Block probably can tell you about the statistics about delaying surgeries, how, how bad it is. That's why it's very important this, and we want to briefly share with you. So I want to ask each of uh, us to introduce ourselves and maybe short, say what we do and uh, how we work in lung cancer. So we want to start with Michaela, that is our navigator, because most of you, when you call, is the first person that you meet. Good evening, everyone. I'm, uh, I feel honored and uh, privileged to be here with all of you. Most of the time, we connect over the phone, and so it's really a joy to see you in person, meet you in person. My name is Mihaela. I'm a patient and a family navigator at Memorial Cancer Institute. My role starts, uh, usually we are the first contact with the patient, so basically when you schedule an appointment, we reach out to you. Uh, we discuss and review your medical history over the phone, make sure you are prepared for the appointments, uh, initial appointment, and obviously uh, we follow up with you after the appointment to make sure that um, you stay compliant with the plan of care that is uh, recommended by the, the oncologist. Um, basically, that's what we do. Um, most of the time, patients call us for different things. So after the first initial visits, they call us to make sure they get uh, support to make appointments for biopsies, or they don't understand, for instance, any more information about what's the PET scan, uh, how do we prepare for that, um, or, or just to um, change different appointments and so. In addition to that, uh, during their, our contact, usually our, the, during our phone calls, um, we assess to make sure you know about our supportive services that we have available. Um, nutritionists, social workers, uh, we have psychologists available for you. We offer also emotional support throughout our contacts and discussions as well as we keep and cement uh, your communication with the medical oncology team. Uh, and we place referrals to make sure you connect as soon as possible with the, the surgical team or medical or radiation oncology team. So um, welcome to Memorial, and you have a navigator here if you need help. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so it's, uh, it's nice to be here. I, I, nice seeing some of, uh, some of the patients I've treated here. And I want to just say uh, congratulate all the, the lung cancer survivors. I think as a clinician and oncologist, it's always nice to see. This is the reason why I think a lot of us became clinicians and oncologists is really to see our patients more in the, in the natural setting and not necessarily in sometimes the artificial setting. Uh, of, of the clinic, um, but I'm Dr. Ignacio Castellan. I'm the Chief of Radiation Oncology at the Memorial Cancer Institute. Um, in the Radiation Oncology Department, we're six radiation oncologists, and we work in a multidisciplinary fashion with our colleagues 
um, as Dr. Rai was saying, in medical oncology, uh, thoracic surgery, um, but also with all of our support services. And you know, our role in radiation oncology, we view it as working together with our colleagues really to try to come up with the best treatment plan for, for our patients and really tailor each patient's uh, treatment based upon their cancer type, their stage, and as a radiation oncologist, really my role is really to try to um, give recommendations as to when we think radiation is appropriate and not just when, but also what type of radiation. So many times as, uh, in, relation, in relation to lung cancer, uh, many times we'll uh, introduce treatments such as stereotactic body radiotherapy for patients with early stage disease that may not be a candidate for surgery. So many times we have these discussions with Dr. Reyes, Dr. Block, and we really try to assess as to what's really going to be the best uh, treatment option for the patient. Sometimes we offer radiation as uh, an adjunctive treatment, maybe after surgery, if, if there are indications for radiation. Sometimes we may do it in combination with chemotherapy and do a more protracted course of treatment. And even in more advanced stage disease or metastatic disease, many times we'll make recommendations as to uh, offering radiation to maybe treat isolated tumors or isolated metastases to really help with quality of life and, and, and um, more control of the disease. Um, I can't stress the importance of really having a specialist of each individual field really collaborating together in a real-time fashion, really so as to really be able to offer the best treatment to our patients. And also being up to date really with the latest advances in treatment, I could tell you that in the 14 years I've been in Memorial, things are always continuously changing in oncology, especially in lung cancer. And uh, as things are evolving, I could tell you the general evolution of radiation has really been to be more selective in the use of radiation, being more targeted with radiation, so as to try to limit side effects uh, for our patients. A lot of that is really Dr. Reyes and Dr. Domingo can talk a little bit more about the latest advances in immunotherapy and targeted therapy in terms of uh, treatments that target a specific mutation. We, we like to think in radiation that we do targeted therapy and that we really focus radiation to where we see masses or nodules in the body. So I think that's the role that I play along with my colleagues in radiation oncology and in the, in, in the thoracic oncology uh, tumor board. Hi, I'm Dr. Helenis, Helenis Domingo. I'm one of the medical oncologists at Memorial. Um, along with Dr. Raez, um, we specialize in lung cancer. Um, it is a very exciting time for lung cancer. I remember when I was a fellow where lung cancer survival was at a much lower rate, uh, but now we have many options to treat lung cancer, including, well, chemotherapy has been established for many years, but now we have, in addition to that, immunotherapy and targeted therapy that we can offer to patients, and we really try to tailor the um, treatment to the patient-specific tumor type. And for this, it's very important that we order molecular testing for patients, and it's something that, at least at Memorial, we've been doing for all of our patients. Um, and it's important to do it from both blood and tissue, and that way we can identify the specific um, molecular composition of the tumor and better decide what treatment is gonna benefit the patient. And the outcomes that we're seeing, you know, it's very rewarding to see how many patients, even with stage four disease, are alive many, many years after their diagnosis. So it is a very exciting time for us in lung cancer, and I am very happy to be here with you today and to be part of this team. Thank you. Okay, so I, uh, I am Lee Rice. I'm also a medical oncologist. Uh, we work with Dr. Domingo, and we, have, we work also with Dr. Hunis. We are. Uh, three uh, medical oncologists that do lung cancer. Uh, basically, to add what Dr. Domingo said, nowadays for us, the most important thing is to classify the lung cancer as soon as it's diagnosed. And for that, we really need the molecular testing. Uh, at Memorial, for many, many years, we already do liquid biopsies. Yeah? Uh, in many centers, they do the tissue biopsy, and only if it's negative, then do the liquid biopsy, but that takes and delays the treatment of the patient weeks. Memorial for the last seven years, every patient gets a blood and the tissue molecular testing from the beginning, and, and all academic centers in the United States do that, and I think this is the right thing. We have a lot of stories that, thanks to that, in eight days, nine days, we can discover if you're a candidate for oral therapy for a pill, and that can make a big difference uh, in your treatment. Um, 
Anyway, so we will be happy to answer questions about these things. Uh, that's why uh, I know when to spend more time and we'll wait for, for your input and your comments. My name is Mark Block, and I am the um, head of the thoracic surgery program at Memorial. Uh, I have a couple of partners, Dr. Tarazi and Dr. Al Zaidi, and some of you may know Dr. Razi, who was with us briefly a few years ago. He's going to be coming back, so there will be four of us in the fall. Um, and I've been with Memorial now for 20 years, and it's really been a pleasure, uh, an educational experience to be with this group, and it makes you want to perform um, for your patients and do the very best you possibly can, not just because your patients care, but because all of your colleagues who are really superb um, are expecting you to be equally good. Uh, most of you probably don't know that surgery for lung cancer has been around for probably 80 years. The very first lung cancer operation was done in St. Louis by a surgeon by the name of Evarts Graham. He did a pneumonectomy on a gynecologist from Baltimore for lung cancer. That was in the 1940s. And the gynecologist actually uh, survived uh, Dr. Graham. He survived his lung cancer and outlived his surgeon. So surgery has been, has been the cornerstone, surgery has been the cornerstone of lung cancer treatment ever since. And one would think that with all of these advancements now in non-surgical therapies, radiation therapy, targeted therapy, and so forth, we would be phasing out the need for surgery. But what we're seeing as part of this multidisciplinary group is that it's actually becoming more important. Not only are we now operating on patients with early stage cancer who are now being getting, given treatments, and previously there was no treatment for somebody with early stage cancer had surgery, you just kind of rolled the dice and did what you did. Now, Dr. Reyes and his colleagues have treatments that have impact and efficacy in these patients. So not only are early stage patients now working with the oncologists, but we are also seeing patients who were previously unresectable, responding to a lot of these great new drugs, and now we're considering surgery for patients who maybe never would have been considered candidates for surgery. So all the advancements on the molecular and targeted and therapeutic level and with radiation therapy are actually making surgery a more important role in the multidisciplinary treatment of lung cancer. And it's really my privilege and pleasure to help guide the surgical component. We are fortunate that Memorial provides us with all of the latest technology. We have multiple surgical robots. You've probably heard about those. We have several of them at our campus at East and several at our campus at West. We have uh, uh, our, our latest technology in invasive diagnostics, bronchoscopy, and biopsy material. Um, so we're fortunate to have all the technology. Um, but it's also really important to make sure that we focus on what's best for our patient and maintain the fundamentals of quality patient care and not let the technology drive the care. The patient drives the care, and the technology is a tool to help us do it better. So it's really a pleasure um, to be a part of this group. I'm a, a pleasure to, to participate in this evening like I've done before. It's a wonderful event. Uh, and congratulations to GoTo Foundation for really making such a great impact, and thank you for including me. My name is Brian Gottkin. I am the uh, medical director of the adult pulmonology group for Memorial Physicians Group. Uh, I have three other partners right now, Dr. Gittler, Dr. Furman, and Dr. Betancourt. Uh, we've been a part of the Memorial system for a long time. I've been there for 23 years. My partner's been there for longer than I have. We're typically the uh, first stop in your journey um, along your lung cancer route. Uh, we will see the patients, whether they come from an incidental finding of a lung nodule on a CT calcium score or on a CAT scan of the abdomen or through lung screening. Um, our goal is to find cancers at an earlier stage now. Uh, typically, we would find them later on because people wouldn't present until they were symptomatic, and at that point, it was, uh, it was already stage four, and I've heard a lot of patients in this room who already have stage four cancer. So I'm very involved in trying to find these lung cancers at an early stage. We have an incidental uh, lung nodule program for those who have the CT calcium, but we also have a screening program for people who are at high risk for developing lung cancer, starting at the age of 50 and going up to the age of 80. And these are high-risk patients, people who are, who are smokers, who either quit smoking within the past 15 years or who actively smoke. Um, not everybody who gets lung cancer has, was a smoker, but it definitely puts you at a higher risk. So we are very involved in uh, finding the lung cancer, diagnosing the lung cancer, 
staging the lung cancer and following the patient through their journey. So oftentimes, like you said, or like you had, you had a, an incidental finding. Uh, you probably had a pulmonologist involved in your care, who, Dr. Gittler, my partner, who helped in the di diagnosis of it. So uh, we work very closely with Dr. Block, Dr. Reyes, um, in helping diagnose the lung cancer, whether it's through a CT guided biopsy or a bronchoscopy or endobronchial ultrasound biopsy. And then we work together, like you were saying, every Monday we have our tumor board, patients are presented, and we come up with the best course of action for that patient. So we typically get involved in doing pulmonary function tests and assessing someone's ability to undergo surgical resection. We also help in maximizing their ability to undergo surgery. So most people, like I said, who have lung cancer are smokers or were former smokers and may have some underlying emphysema, COPD. So we help in treating those patients, getting them ready for surgery. Um, we also follow them through their course. So sometimes there can be complications related to some of the immunotherapy or related to some of the radiation. And, and we're there all along the way working with uh, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and thoracic surgeons. And we're, we're sort of like the, the constant force through the course. And, uh, and I'm glad to be a part of this group. Um, and we're here for you guys, whatever you need. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Marisol, and I'm a pharmacy tech. Um, I've been a medication access specialist in oncology since 2019. Um, my role is to assist patients that are experiencing um, medication access barriers um, to help uh, obtain and maintain um, their prescribed therapies. Um, my goal is um, to decrease um, the financial burden that uninsured and uh, underinsured patients experience uh, due to high cost specialty medications. Um, and it feels uh, very rewarding to be able to, um, uh, to be able to help our patients afford their therapies. Um, I understand the uh, importance of being able to start treatment and uh, work closely with you and your direct healthcare provider uh, in facilitating access to your medications. Thank you, Marisol. Um, <laughs> she's very humble because she's the most important member of the team, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, I can prescribe you the, the best pill for lung cancer and you will never get it if it's not because of her. You well, know that, I, that. I can go more into depth. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> When I get referrals for um, assistance, I um, evaluate each case and identify the best um, program options to meet your needs. Not a lot of patients are aware that uh, many drug companies offer assistance programs um, that provide free or reduced cost medications. Um, some of them are income-based, however, each foundation is able to set their, their own guidelines, so they're not just for low-income families, um, which is great because it allows a much uh, greater population an opportunity to enroll. So the medication access specialist will complete the applications um, have them submitted, um, do follow-ups directly with the programs uh, to ensure that there's um, no um, potential delays in treatment. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> one last thing. So, um, we, um, we do um, assist and provide support um, throughout the entire uh, enrollment process, um, which also alleviates you know, some of the stress and burden that our patients may already have. I'm on or not, there you go. Um, it's such an important role, I know um, at the foundation, we have a helpline, and 60% of our callers are looking for some sort of assistance 
in paying for the care that's being prescribed to them. And it's, it's a, a, lung, a, lung, a cancer diagnosis, let alone a lung cancer diagnosis, in it, is in and of itself a heavy burden. And then to be told this is the best treatment option for you, but sorry, you either can't afford it or get access to it for whatever reason is right. such a huge role. So, uh, and the fact that Memorial even has this as part of their multi multidisciplinary team is such a testament to the work and the care that you give to the people diagnosed in this community. Yeah. Yeah. So we just want um, <laughs> patients to know that um, we're, we're here to um, provide support and um, navigate the medication access journey. No, thank you, thank you, Marisol. Uh, no, this is, this, is, this is very important because I think, I, I told you at the beginning of the conversation, we are the public health care system. So if you're living our territory and, and you are an insurer or you, you have a bad insurance or whatever, we know that we need to help. And in that regard, I want to give thanks. We have a lot of people from industry tonight here also. We want to give thanks because uh, industry has been very supportive uh, when we have patients that don't have insurance uh, to, to provide uh, uh, and replace the drug that we use, either IV or pills. So that's why we are very, very grateful because in, this is the only country in the world because, you know, our, our society is worldwide, ISLC, we know that. This is the only country in the world that we will get free drug if you don't have insurance, okay? So it still works here, so we are very proud to be in this country. So, uh, but the problem is the, the other ones, the, the middle class, we. Okay, so I, I have a challenge to you. If I prescribe you today a $20,000 pill, what is your copayment? Who can tell me what is your copayment? $2,000. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's my copayment. If somebody prescribed me a $20,000 pill, I don't have a clue what's my copayment. I have to call Marisol. You know, I say, and the problem is then most of us discover, oh, the insurance says, oh, no problem. You are covered. Your copayment is $500 a month, $1,000 a month, $2,000 a month. You say, what good coverage is if I had to pay $2,000 a month? That is why uh, the middle class, we, we have a major issue that uh, we need to be calling and we need a reimbursement specialist to help us navigate. So I'm very proud to say, to make this story short, in 13 years I work at Memorial, I had never had a prescribed a pill and the patient never got it. One way or the other, the patient gets the pill. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, so uh, we want to hear from the patients. If you want to make any comments, uh, you know, or any questions, okay. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. Hi, Dr. Reyes. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question because um, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to, you knew about the biomarkers, and I qualified for the biomarkers, so I've just been on the target therapy, didn't have to do radiation, and I'm, I'm um, stage four, so I didn't have to do radiation or chemo. And so after the six months of taking this pill, I had no side effects, not one side effects. Dr. Reyes didn't believe I was really taking the pill every day. <laughs> um, until I got my PET scan back, and so as I said of last week, my tumor was totally dead. So does that mean I'm cancer free, or do I have to wait for the two years with the pill? Um, what does that mean, exactly? So you, you, there is no evidence of cancer, but mm -hmm. we know that uh, to be cured, we need to wait five years at least, no, normally, because lung cancer grows fast. If, if it's hiding there, it will grow back at some point but you don't have to wait 20 years. We, we most of us put a five-year rule. So you are in remission, but, okay. but uh, hopefully, you know, you'll reach your five years. We have people here that have reached five years. We have in the practice very blessed. We have people that have reached 20 years. So, so you never lose hope because you never know who is going to be successful. The best thing is you always have to fight, you know? So what, what do you think? Thank you. She's my hope right there. Yeah. <laughs> So I have an add-on question t t t to that. Okay. Um, there, once people get to those five years, and I have patients that I talk to who have been on their targeted therapy with no evidence of disease for 10 years, and they're terrified to come off drug. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the issue. We're scared, too, because when we find disease recurrence on a scan, that means there's enough cells there that to form a tumor that is at least half a centimeter, a centimeter in size that we're able to detect it in a scan. And by that time, that means there's many, many cancer cells that are growing. So everyone puts the patient on the pill and then when can we 
take it off. You know, it's a little scary that we take patients off these pills and then the cancer comes back and it comes back with a vengeance and then can we get it back into remission? That's questionable. So a lot of us tend to keep patients on the pill as long as they're tolerating the treatment with no side effects and the cancer seems to be doing well and we should keep an eye and keep watching you. So we can stay on that pill forever. As long as it's working, right? No, I, I think uh, most of these pills are new. Remember, we, we didn't use pills until 10 years ago, probably, and so that's why we need more evidence, more data, so one day we'll tell you, like they do in breast cancer, you know, there are pills in breast cancer you take for three years, they got to be for five years, and they're always, you know, I think I'm taking for 10 years. But, you know, that's why we need more time. We need more time. But in the meantime, as Dr. Domingo said, the pills are non-toxic. If you don't get sick, actually, I have survivors from eight or nine years, I tell you, hey, if you want, don't take the pill, and let's see what happens. And they say, no, 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 I'd rather take the pill then don't take the pill, you know, so because they, they are not very toxic, so. This is from Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> well, yesterday I got an email, right? <laughs> and, you know, you know I didn't sleep last night because they're telling me that um, I'm almost up, but I, I got um, certified in December, and I called them today, and they're telling me, well, you only have X amount, and you have to go and try someone else. So I went online right away, and I tried AZ and me, and they're saying, oh, you're not eligible. So I said, you know something, I, I got to call Maricel, my lifesaver, so we got we to gotta talk. <laughs> we'll definitely talk about it, <laughs> okay. yes. but... Um, as far as enrollments go, um, we track all of our patients who are enrolled in the assistance program. So we, we keep track of it and we know exactly when your enrollment's about to expire and work um, ahead of time um, to get the re-enrollment process going and approved for the following year. So you did that, but then they sent me this email from this company and you know, I don't know what to do. I can I follow, I, I'll follow up. <laughs> the only side effect I have for me, it breaks my nails, so I can't have fancy nails, but that's okay. I can do without <laughs> the fancy nails, you know. But I just want to make sure that. Yeah, we'll know. definitely talk. Yeah, so we talk. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody is having the issue, but I just brought it up. Thank you. said before, my name is Mel Brown, Melroy Brown, but I just want to thank between Dr. Domingo and Marisol, because when they told me I was to take this new pill to Grasso or something yes. like that, okay, <laughs> and they said, if, it's, if you have a problem with it, you know, that's what Dr. Domingo said, if there's a problem with the cost, and so be it, I had a problem, they told me that, that you know, the cost and my out of pocket was a thousand dollars. So I spoke to Marisol. She got it going the first three months and then July December I got another letter that they're not taking me I I'm not on the can be on the program again. I actually cried. <laughs> and I called, I text and I got Marisol and she helped me and I'm I'm back on getting my pills again. So that's the good thing. <laughs> So anybody else? So, yeah. To me, it seems like a silly question, but I've been wanting to know, how many non-small cell lung cancers are there? Like I was diagnosed with adenal carcinoma, and I'm just wondering how many other non-small cell cancers are there? And are there many? So let me ask you to clarify your question. Do you mean how many different types of lung um, cancer are there, or how many patients are there with lung cancer? Like, I guess how common is my lung cancer, adenocarcinoma? I may be saying it wrong, but that's the way I've been saying it since I was diagnosed, so I can't change. But um, how common is it? Is that more of the more common lung cancers? Sure. So non small cell. Let me try and answer both okay. questions. So every year there are about 170 or 180,000 people diagnosed with lung cancer. 
about 80% of them are non-small cell lung cancers. So 20% are small cell. The non-small cell category is made up primarily of two different types. Adenocarcinoma is the most common. Squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common. And then there are a handful of others that are, you know, 5, 10% of the rest. So adenocarcinoma is, I think, about 60 to 70% of non-small cell lung cancers. Okay. Thank you. I think it's a really interesting question, too, because even in the 20 years that I've been living in this lung cancer space, things have changed drastically, right? Which is one of the reasons I think a multidisciplinary team is such an important part of a person's care. But even when you look at adenocarcinoma and then you look at biomarkers that could potentially be associated with that, we break it down even further. And in the adeno space, I've been known to re refer to it, particularly in those that do have biomarkers, as a series of more rare types of lung cancer. So you're dealing with a, a rare cancer versus lung cancer as a whole, which is the most common. I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you explain that, I guess, to your patients, right? Because EGFR, for example, is what, 15 percent? Yeah, we, we have, in the adenocarcinomas, we have a lot of biomarkers. Mm -hmm. And most of the, we have more than 15 uh, oral drugs approved for, for adenocarcinomas. Um, and there are, but in squamous cell carcinomas, we do have biomarkers. The problem is that we don't have the drugs yet. So we know the targets, and we are, we are working very hard to develop drugs, but we have not been very successful. The same in that small group of small cell lung cancer. The small cell lung cancer is not like there is no markers. There is targets, but there are targets, but we haven't been successful developing the oral therapy against these, those markers. Uh, at the end, the future of oncology is going to be like that, you know. So lo in lung cancer, we are the ones that do more molecular testing. But sooner or later, in the other cancers, they have to do the same. Because as we know, the tumors are not, doesn't matter even where the tumor is located, you know. For example, in Memorial, we participated in the approval of a drug called uh, larotrectinib that was approved in 2018. The drug was approved with only 60 patients in the world because it's, it's, unfortunately it's only 1%, 1% of the lung cancers, you know, so. But the, it was a very compelling because these 60 patients have felt everything and pretty much all of them responded. But the interesting thing is there were no 60 patients with lung cancer. There were 60 patients that have 15 different tumors. So this drug works now, today works for more than 20 tumors. And three or four of these tumors were tumors for, for kids. So that's why we are going, to, we're moving from we are going to treat the cancer based what is located to what is the molecular aberration that the cancer has. Because this pill works in a target called Entrac. Entrac is in lung, is in breast, is in sarcoma, is in adults. There are kids with a weird tumor called a, a nephroblastoma. As long as the genetic aberration is responsible of the cancer, the pill can kill it. So that's why we're, we're switching from, oh, you know, I'm an expert. There is not going to be lung cancer expert in 20 years here. Maybe we'll be an expert in some molecular aberration. Right. Because that is what matters nowadays. That's what this is, Dr. Domingo was talking about. The molecular testing is extremely important. And you, as patients and patient advocates and family, when you go to the do doctor, you have to say, doctor, are you going to do my molecular testing? They say, oh, yeah, we did it, and it was negative in the tissue. No, no I want not to get it done in the blood, because that can be a lifesaver, or at least give me a chance to fight. You know, or to prolong my survival because uh, all the science is based on that, you know, looking for targets for lung cancer so we can have less toxic therapies that are more efficient. Is that the testing you do prior to treating the patient? Yeah. So uh, if I was with you for the last four years, you did that for me. Yeah, as okay. I was saying, everybody gets done in blood right. and in tissue, so we have a double opportunity to find something that can be helpful for you. Gotcha. Dr. Rice, could you explain a little bit the important, what you're saying about a tissue biopsy versus a liquid biopsy, and maybe explain the heterogeneity of, and why, why both. Yeah, what happened is we discovered these genetic aberrations, these gene alterations in the tissue. So that's why for the last seven, eight years worldwide, you have a new, new patient diagnosed with lung cancer, we start to look what is the, in the tissue, the genetic aberration. The problem is because we had to ship this tissue samples to some laboratories. Sometimes you call pathology and say, please uh, ship the sample of Mr. Rice, and the pathology 
technician is busy, oh, I'll do tomorrow, I'll do next week, today is Friday, I'll do Monday. So the moment that you ship the sample and the, ship, the sample arrives, takes two or three weeks to be processed. And all of this time, you already visit us, we already told you you have lung cancer, metastatic, you need therapy, and we cannot tell you what therapy is, and you need to wait one, two, three, four weeks. So that was very frustrating for the patient. So that's why we were lucky that they developed what we call liquid biopsies. So what we do is in the blood, we take a blood sample, we isolate the tumor, DNA, and we run the molecular testing there. It only takes eight days. So in eight days, we can tell everybody what is the treatment for you. Okay, but I, was, I mentioned it before, this is not done in, in all the United States yet. Everybody's still doing the tissue and sometimes do the blood only three weeks later when they, the report said, oh, there is not enough tissue. And now they send the blood and the patient keeps waiting for the tissue. Now waiting for, it's a lot of waiting and nobody wants to be waiting when they have a bad diagnosis. So, but Lewis, you can't make a diagnosis of lung cancer based upon a liquid biopsy. You still need tissue for the diagnosis, correct? And you would need yeah, that, that's the next, that's the most amazing thing, you know. So we, 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 we diagnose can, lung cancer or any cancer in the tissue. But, you know, we have limitation. This is a very important question. There are technologies and companies that are trying to diagnose cancer in the blood. So that is our ultimate goal for all of us. We want you to go to your primary care every year, check your cholesterol, whatever, and check a blood test that can tell, hey, you have lung cancer, you have this, because it takes 800 mammograms to find one breast cancer, okay? And it takes 250 CAT scans to find one lung cancer. So the other ones are a waste of time and you're exposing people. That's why this is a very important question. There is, you want to hear in the news, there are several companies advertising, hey, we are very close, we are going to make it. We don't recommend as a cancer society yet any of these tests, but you're going to hear there are companies that are trying to isolate the cancer in the blood, and some of them are more successful than others. But I, I hope it's the future. Yeah, for us, the, the, my dream is that you go to primary care, they draw the blood, oh, it seems that you have breast cancer, that's the day you go for your mammogram. The rest of the time you don't need mammogram. You know, and then we do the same. And the advantage of that is today, if you think about, we only screen for four cancers or five cancers. We will draw the blood and we'll screen you for 50 cancers. We'll screen you for pancreas cancer, liver cancer, a lot of cancers that we'll never found unless we screen you. But there is no screening for that. That seems so far away. You know, it's it's much closer. It just no, the reason why we are warning you is because there are companies that today, if you pay $800, they will do for you. What happened is it's not very accurate. So that's why we, we, we warn you that we're very close, but it's not standard of care yet. We want them success, in other words. Does anybody else have a question? <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know if this is a crazy question. You might have kind of answered it. Like, if you get a PET scan now um, and it comes up clear, is it still very important to go get that mammogram and that colonoscopy and all of those type of tests since the PET scan came up clear? Yeah, um, it's, it's still very important because um, you know, for instance, like in the breast cancer world, there could be some breast tumors that maybe are not very active on the PET scan and they could be missed on the PET scan. So many times with uh, breast screening, many times they'll do a mammogram with an ultrasound uh, just because there could be some tumors that even though it's negative on PET, even the radiologist will, will mention, you know, um, this tumor is not very metabolically active on the PET scan. You may want to consider getting another imaging test to, to better detect or, or screen. So specific to like breast cancer, there are many instances in which we can see low-grade breast cancers, sometimes like lobular cancers um, that don't really show up well on PET scan. And it's still worthwhile to get mammogram and ultrasound. Um, even for colon cancer, the idea behind a colon cancer is really to detect a small polyp when it's really not even detectable with imaging studies, and many times you can have a small polyp that won't get picked up on an MRI or a CAT scan, but on the colonoscopy, the, the gastroenterologist can see the polyp and they can remove it, and then they can test it. So those screening tests are still gonna be very important. Just because you have a negative PET scan doesn't necessarily mean that a person is completely cancer-free. I mean, it's news nobody wants to hear, but 
um, sometimes those screening tests are still going to be important for those patients. Yeah, sometimes on the PET scan, um, you know, very commonly what we see in the clinic, it could be maybe a lung cancer patient getting a PET scan, and there could be an incidental finding either in the breast or right. some other organ. Exactly. And the radiologist may call to the clinician to call it to their attention that the patient should maybe be sent for additional testing or imaging right. specific to that exactly. organ. Exactly. Um, so a negative PET scan doesn't necessarily mean that one is absolutely cancer-free, that's a good bit of news. Uh, but a PET scan can have incidental findings where maybe additional testing may be required right. to, to that's find it. That's what I was wondering because, you know, maybe you can't really say just yet the image of it or something yeah. on, on a PET. Yeah. So I'd like to add just a little bit about PET scan because I have this conversation with my patients all the time. I think there's a general misconception that a PET scan is a cancer test, and it's really not. Okay, a PET scan is a test that demonstrates increased metabolic activity. Right, so metabolic activity is how our body uses energy, and the more energy that a tissue is using, the brighter it will show up on the scan. So anything that's got increased activity is gonna light up in proportion to the extent of activity. So for example, the heart, which is constantly beating, has a high metabolic rate, and it shows it very hot on the PET scan. So cancers will light up on PET scan depending upon how quickly they are growing. Rapidly growing cancers will be very bright. Some cancers that are growing very slowly will have no activity at all. And then other things that we see in the lung or other parts of the body can have activity but not be cancer. The most common is a source of infection, a site of infection. You can imagine there's a lot of activity at that site of infection. Those areas can be very bright on the PET scan, so they can be misleading. So a PET scan is not a cancer test. It's very helpful. The way I discuss it with patients is that if we know you have a cancer, it's helpful to get a PET scan to see whether it has spread anywhere. It doesn't really tell us very much about the cancer itself, but it tells us whether it's in any other places. That being said, it's not a perfectly sensitive test. Small tumors are too small to be seen on the PET scan. So it's very helpful. I think it's most helpful in what we call staging it's not great at diagnosis. Indudablemente que el avance de la ciencia es realmente importantísimo en la salud. Pero yo pregunto, se está avanzando igualmente en lograr los mecanismos para combatir los efectos secundarios? porque generalmente todas estas medicinas se están avanzando, pero generalmente traen esos efectos secundarios que hay, aparentemente en algunos casos no hay una, una medicina que atienda y combate exactamente todos los medicamentos, eh, esos, esos efectos secundarios, y, y se pasan unos momentos bastante complicados y difíciles en la salud. Yeah, he's, no, he's asking that uh, if the technology is so efficient, if the medication is so advanced, um, what about the, the secondary effects of those medications? Because uh, there are some patients that are struggling with the secondary effects of the drugs that seem to be so sophisticated, but then they're still having now issues with the side effects. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. This, that's one of the most important topics that we were just discussing now. Uh, and that's why we're trying to move away from the more toxic therapies such as the chemotherapy. Uh, but even in that, um, in, in that uh, um, terrain, we've made a lot of advancements. Like I remember before when we give chemotherapy to patients, they would be vomiting and you know, very, 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 very sick and hospitalized. Now we're at a point where we have come up with a lot of medications to prevent that from happening. So typically patients that go on chemotherapy, they'll receive anti-emetic drugs to try to prevent the nausea from coming on even before it starts. Um, and then we have newer medications that we can send home with the patient that they can use in case nausea develops at home. Uh, similarly, we have growth factor support, which are injections that we can give patients to try to boost up their immune system after chemotherapy is given to try to prevent that infection from, from coming in. Uh, but, but the most important is that we're trying to move away from chemotherapy and hopefully identify a target in every patient that we can treat with targeted therapy 
and move away from chemotherapy. And that's what Dr. Rice is describing, that hopefully in the future, we're able to discover the mechanism of pathogenesis in every tumor and target that specifically, and try to move away from chemotherapy, which is a more broad approach to cancer treatment. Dr. Jamego, can you, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I think side effect management is a, we get calls about that a lot too, right? And a lot of times actually, people living with lung cancer are afraid to talk to their healthcare provider for fear of coming off drug um, and not really having another best first option. Palliative care is something that we're really um, um, big on at GoTo and having conversations with our, with our patients that come in and their loved ones about talking to their healthcare providers about this supportive care. I think there's still some confusion out in the lay world about palliative care versus hospice care. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we do have, uh, as part of a multidisciplinary team, uh, palliative care and hospice care, well, hospice referrals as options. Um, palliative care referring to treatment of symptoms that can come on as a result of the cancer or the therapy itself. Um, so we have doctors that we can refer to for help with that. And as oncologists, we also, you know, obviously keep a close eye on our patients and Every time they come in for treatment, we check to see what symptoms have come on as a result of the therapy or the cancer and try to come up with the best solution to help with those symptoms and support the patient through the treatment and get them through so they can have a good quality of life and they're able to go through their treatment successfully. Yeah, that's a very important question because, uh, as Dr. Domingo said, uh, we have two doctors that do palliative care, one nurse practitioner, we have three psychologists, and uh, that's a part of the hospice team. And uh, you don't, hospice is when you, you, we, we, you are in, in the end of the life and there is no more treatment. But palliative care, there is palliative care there, but also palliative care can be at any time. You know, for example, you are a new patient, but you have a lot of bone metastasis, you are in a lot of pain. And you know, you, you're a witness, you know, so we, we see you in 20 or 30 minutes and discussing the chemo, the side effects, the plan, questions. We, we easily, you know, run out of time all the time. So we have a palliative expert that sees you and sits with you. Actually, they, they are allowed to have very long visits, like 40, 50 minute visits, and they discuss the pain management, for example, you know. They discuss the pain management, they are board certified on that. That's what is very important. So they focus in pain management. They focus, for example, a lot of patients when they come, they are underweight, they are malnourished because the cancer consumes them. They focus on that. We have, for example, integrative medicine, uh, or integrative medicine doctor, if he finds indication to give you a CBD or THC that you need it, he will prescribe for you. So that's why, yeah, uh, that is very important because it complements a lot what we do, and, uh, and also, we are the, the chemo experts, you know, and uh, it's hard for us to keep track of what is the new pill for appetite, what is the new pill for weight loss, what is the, the new pill for pain management, what are the regulations for, no, the, for, for, for pain dispensing medication. So, um, for example, our doctors in palliative care, they do some sort of contrast with the patients so they, they, to, to protect them for, uh, to go into many other places. And, you know, that's why there is a lot of things, that's why we need to have specialists and, and palliative care, as I said, uh, you, you don't need to be dying to be in palliative care. You can be from day one, and that's what we're trying to offer the patients as an extra service that can be very valuable for them. I didn't realize that. I had no idea. I thought it was more like a hospice palliative care, end of life, or mm -hmm. dealing with a chronic condition, but more or less end of life. I never yeah. realized that. So, that's so if you're enrolling hospice services, if you enroll with hospice services, that means you're not getting any more cancer-directed therapy. But you can still have cancer-directed therapy and be treated by a palliative care doctor to address all the symptoms that can come on. No, no. no. One comment I want to make about symptom management is, I think that's the importance of the multidisciplinary approach, is um, it's not just having the palliative care doctor, but it's also really the team talking together, really to try to formulate a treatment plan that's gonna be best for that individual patient. Much what gets discussed in these tumor board discussions really is what's the functional status of the patient? What is it, the treatment that they're able to tolerate? So there's always a discussion, and Dr. Block can comment on, you know, what would be maybe 
the surgical approach that the patient may be able to tolerate if they're not a surgical candidate? What would be the radiation approach that we can use? Is there an alternative treatment to that? What's the molecular profile? Maybe instead of chemo giving chemotherapy, you can give targeted therapy or immunotherapy. And all that is really, that discussion is really, at, at the crux of it is really, what is the patient able to tolerate? Because ultimately, it's best, the, the best symptom management is to avoid the toxicity or the symptoms. So you're, there's always a discussion as to what is the patient able to tolerate. In addition to that, we have a pulmonologist uh, we have the pulmonology team uh, in, in in the tumor board. I just wanted to say that because I didn't realize you were with his group, and he's wonderful. He got me in the next day. And sometimes it's really optimizing pulmonary function and pulmonary management. So that is, I think, the importance of the multidisciplinary approach. It's not just, it's not like we just get together and say, all right, this is the recipe. The patient has this type of cancer, this diagnosis, this is the treatment they're going to get. We kind of have to take all those factors into consideration. I, I agree. Oh, no, go ahead. Andrew, go ahead. I'm a little off subject, but I would be remiss if I didn't take one minute to say that my husband has been um, a victim. He's been a person who's fortunate that he takes the targeted therapies. And I'm very active in a group called ROS1 on the internet where you get accepted into the group. And all over this country, people and all over the world can't find drugs, they can't find doctors. They can't find people who really know what to do with their particular type of cancer. And we go without saying that if it weren't for Dr. Reyes, Harvey wouldn't be here. He knows his stuff. He is an individual with his team second to none. They know every medication. And he has been there through this wonderful journey that it is with lots of side effects. We had a lot. He knew, he told us ahead of time. He's always been cognizant of what could happen, and he prepared us. And most importantly, I think anybody sitting here has to feel very fortunate, because I feel truly blessed. We say God is good, our team is good. And that's why people live, because you care, and you put together the approach where you research, you do your homework and you truly care, and that, I think, has to be said. I think it's such a, a, a valid point, and this team, there are so many direct, different directions this conversation could have gone tonight, and it would have gone hours and hours and hours. Um, um, but I think one of the, you make a really great point. I mean, you beautiful people in this room, and watching live from locally here who have the benefit of having this team. That's not the case around this country, right? Particularly in more rural settings, small community hospitals where, you know, we always recommend that folks, regardless of where they live, get a second opinion with a set of experts. You can go get treated close to home, but get, a, get an opinion from people who walk, talk, live, and breathe um, lung cancer because things are happening so fast and furiously particularly over the last decade and a half. And for any one doctor to be able, or to be expected, I guess, to keep up with everything that's happening so fast, um, it's kind of unfair. But um, having a team like this is great. I am being mindful of time. I do have one question, but I want to make sure nobody else. Yeah. Just get the mic right behind you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, this is a question for the panel. Um, what would be your recommendation to the family? Because we have been talking about the patients. They are the ones who have the pain, the certainty, the fear, but uh, maybe we suffer in silence, the, 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 the close family. <laughs> what would be your recommendation as a doctors to the family? Yeah, that, that's a very important question because um, we, um, in the last years, we recognize another entity that's the, like the, the doctors get born out, the caregivers get born out much more, you know, and, uh, and they are not allowed to complain, they are not allowed to talk because the patient is number one, you know, so all of us would sacrifice uh, happily for our loved ones, you know, but maybe it doesn't have to be like that, you know, that's why uh, we are lucky that we have advocate organizations that they go to the same in our, in our own cancer center that we really care about the caregivers and uh, 
And uh, for example, in Memorial, we keep track of uh, what we call social determinants of health. So uh, yeah, the, the medical side is important, but we want to know if you have food problems, you know, if you have transportation problems. We, need, we want to know if you have a loved one to help you or no. And there is a list of social determinants of health that we need to track, because otherwise, I can prescribe you the best immunotherapy of the world, and you will never show up to the appointment. So that we will not achieve our goal. And the same thing with uh, the importance to have the caregivers, but I think um, we recognize that the burnout of the caregivers is very important, and this is something that needs to be addressed. You are not Superman, you know, and, uh, and as I said, we will give our life for our loved one. Probably everybody can say that, but uh, it doesn't have to be like that. You know, like I, I have a lot of very sad stories because the caregivers get burned out and, you know, they have a very difficult times and the patient also already is in a difficult situation to, to deal with more. And that is why I think this is a very important topic that, the same as the doctors, you know, say, oh, they, you know, um, I took over in 2001 uh, practice. I was hired, uh, like, like the Domingo was hired to help me. No, they confused her with my daughter, but she's not my daughter, I have two boys. <laughs> she's my partner. And uh, my, the doctor was 48, and I was like a 32, 33. Well, to make the story short, the doctor died two years later. All the patients survived the doctor. The doctor was not supposed to die. And the doctor was burned out, he was extremely depressed, I think he got cancer because of that, at 48, and he died. You know? And then we started to talk about many sad stories like that, the caregivers get burned out, the doctors get burned out. And these are things that we need to fix, otherwise we are not going to be successful in this task, you know? Yeah, and I'll give a shameless plug to go to as well. We do um, um, care about the caregivers, and we have a couple of different programs where we can connect you with other caregivers where you can have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. There's actually a sign-up sheet in the back. It's called our Phone Buddy Program. It's for patients and caregivers alike, where we match you as closely as we can to someone who's walking in your shoes, everything from your age, your demographic, your diagnosis, um, all of that. So same thing for caregivers. So feel free to sign up and back. And, and also you guys have, uh, they have a very interesting program that they have survivors also. For example, I think two or three of our patients who are with GoTo, they can give you counseling, either to the family or to the patient. So if you want to talk to a survivor, uh, they, they connect you with the survivor. And, and as I said, some of our patients do that happily. And uh, so these are resources that, you know, they can talk to you more about that. Anyone else? I have one last question, and it's been kind of buzzing around here in the back of my mind since we've been talking. And Dr. Gottgen, it's, it's to you, because I think all too often um, I hear folks who've been diagnosed with lung cancer say they've never seen a pulmonologist, and it just floors me every time, because it is, it, not only does it seem really logical, I mean, this is a disease in your lungs. You are a lung doctor. <laughs> like, it just makes perfect sense. And I know um, uh, my mom had a, her own sort of experience with some pulmonary issues related to COPD. She also had um, her upper left lobe removed, so the majority of the left side of her lung. Um, and nobody had ever told her, for example, about how she might react in altitude. And not just altitude, like I'm going to the mountains this weekend, but altitude I'm getting in an airplane and flying across the country, right? Because I think most folks don't know that they pressurize airplanes at about 8,000 feet. <laughs> and if you're struggling to breathe at 8,000 feet, you should know that before you get on an airplane and fly across the country. And so things like altitude tests, ongoing pulmonary function tests, can you talk a little bit about? Yeah, no, I, I think that we are an important uh, part of the team. Um, I think we should be constant throughout the journey. Um, like you said, uh, people have other issues other than can uh, cancer related, surgery related. People have underlying lung disease and then they go and they have part of their lung removed and they may, they may be great, but then they may not. They may have some shortness of breath, they may have some cough, they may have some wheeze. They may get, their oxygen level may drop when they walk around. They, they may need oxygen. They may need inhalers, they may need nebulizers. You know, they're getting radiation. Maybe there's some changes on the CAT scan that look like it's inflammation, but maybe it's pneumonia and they need antibiotics. So I do think it's important to establish with a pulmonologist through your course because we're here to help. 
you know, and we do talk with everybody. You know, I speak with Dr. Aya as if, you know, there's a new immunotherapy drug and somebody comes in and they're short of breath and I need to know, do I need to start this person on steroids today because they're having a pneumonitis? Or, you know, with, with Dr. Block, if uh, someone has some pain because they had surgery, they have a little bit of rib pain, should I start them on gabapentin or just to help me help the patient? So I do think that it's important for us to be there, to answer questions, to help with any potential complications, and to, to help with the shortness of breath, the cough that may persist uh, during the course of therapy. And should it be on your team, though? Like no, it doesn't. It, it, as long as you have a pulmonologist, yeah. stick with your pulmonologist, <laughs> as long as you're happy. Yeah. The phone's going to be ringing. I'm not recruiting patients. <laughs> Tomorrow morning. <laughs> no, but I do think that a, a pulmonologist should be a part of your team. Okay. Anybody else before we close up? I, I just want to oh. give a compliment to Memorial. Um, we would love to do 15 years. Um, actually, I worked for Memorial for 32 years, and five, two years ago. But I was um, originally Joey Maggio. I was St. Joey Maggio. I was a part of the church of St. Paul Nine. So um, we started that multi a rock for me. I did not do well with the chemo at all. And um, I called every day. Every day I was every day I was sick. And I was so sick. And Dr. Reyes was always on top of everything. And Paola always answered my calls or my messages immediately. I never had to wait. It was always come in, I'll hydrate you. You know, it was one of those things. But and I also want to thank Dr. Block so much for my surgery was successful my treatment was successful and as i said before i'm four years in remission and i can't wait to climb over that five year the only thing is i'm wondering i get ct scans every six months now when i was changed to six months it was very scary because i wanted to keep going every three months um because i didn't want to wait the six months you know i was so nervous it was going to come back what happens at that five year? Do you then stop with the CT scans if you're clear? What happens is, as I said, lung cancer is a fast-growing tumor that is a course because it can kill you fast, but it's a blessing in the way that if it doesn't come back, you know that it's not there. If you're a survivor of prostate cancer, you have to be waiting 20 years later and you don't know if it will come back next year. Mm -hmm. But the problem is most, most of the patients have smoked before, so that's why we save them from one but we don't know if the second one is coming. Uh, I, I, we even have people that still are currently smoking. Mm -hmm. um, I have 
following, for example, a patient for 20 years, we already have treated four, four cancers that are different. Um, that is why after five years, uh, based on your risk, um, I think that Togotsky mentioned, we do your long screening. Mm -hmm. The benefit of that is, is, is only 20% of the amount of radiation in the, the, the common CAT scan that we do now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, do, we do without contrast, we do once a year. Um, and, and hopefully soon we'll incorporate what also Togotsky was mentioning, the blood test. So with the blood test and the long screening once a year, we'll be able to hopefully catch any cancer that is coming uh, very, in a very early stage. One more question. You mentioned that there's another type. I had the adenocarcinoma. I know I spelled it wrong, but there's also a, um, what was the other type? Squamous. 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 If you have squamous cell on your skin, could that spread? Does that have anything to do with a squamous cell lung cancer? Can it spread from your mm -hmm. skin to? So, um, I mean, squamous cells. A, a it's I'm just cell hearing it because I had squamous cell yeah. in my hand, so I was just thinking back like eight years ago I had that. So squamous so. cells, uh, it's a cell type, mm -hmm. so in that, in that you can have a squamous cell of different organs. Gotcha. So okay. you can have a squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, of the lung, of the head and neck area. There are GYN cancers mm -hmm. that could be squamous cells. So that just describes the cell type itself. Gotcha. But when somebody has a squamous cell car diagnosis of a squamous, squamous cell carcinoma, that's where you need to know where it originated from, and really the risk of spread and, and the treatment type really depends upon gotcha. the tissue of origin. Okay. But the fact that it was in your skin doesn't mean that necessarily it's gonna go to your lungs. Actually, skin cancer rarely spreads, and lung, especially if you're saying on, on the hand area, mm -hmm. I would not expect that to go to your lungs. Gotcha, thank you very much, because it would have been with something more I'd go home and worry about, so I had to ask. I th the other thing is true about uh, adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma, it's just a description of what it looks like on the microscope. And adenocarcinomas show up in all different organs of the body. The GI tract, the breast can be adenocarcinoma. So you can have adenocarcinoma, but it can be a completely different type of cancer. It's just the description, the microscopic gotcha. description. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. So the treatment of adenocarcinoma, uh, if it shows up, is there more of treatment depending on your lungs, or say if it's in the liver or something? No, that's what we mentioned before, that uh, as Dr. Roy just said, adenocarcinomas look the same. <laughs> No, the only difference okay. is in which organ they were. But we never understood before why the adenocarcinoma of the breast has a different treatment than the adenocarcinoma of the lung, if they have the same name. Now we know, because based on the genes, we know that the genes in the, adeno in the breast are different than the genes on the lung. That is why we behave different. That's why we discovered that the treatments are different. That's why the future is we are going to base treatment only in the genes. It will not matter in which organ the tumor is going to be. Uh, we're gonna do the AI for the lung cancer. <laughs> <laughs> that was a killer thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. A huge, huge, huge thank you to our panel. Um, I do want to close out with a little bit of housekeeping. I don't know if Melanie's still here. Oh, there you are. You came and sat down. Um, to talk a little bit about the White Ribbon Project, we did 30 seconds. Just, we've got some white ribbons here. Um, uh, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Melanie's from Johnson & Johnson, um, our industry partners, spreading the love uh, about lung cancer. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm not here on behalf of Johnson & Johnson. We're here on behalf of the patients and the Goju Foundation. Yeah. Thank you for allowing us to join. And I'm sorry, my back's towards you. It's so rude. Um, the White Ribbon Project is about community. And so when you are diagnosed with lung cancer, when you're a caregiver of someone with lung cancer, when you're someone that's passionate about supporting the cause, you are a part of this community. We find that folks who have an amazing community around them do better on therapy. So the White Ribbon Project has partnered with the GoTo Foundation, and thank you for allowing me to talk about of this. Um, and, and they build white ribbons. Heidi and Pierre are a family um, from Colorado. When Heidi was diagnosed, she realized that there was nothing around her and there was nothing for awareness. So she asked her husband to build a big ribbon, and this is what was developed. And so from a ribbon that Heidi developed for her front door for awareness, it has gone around the country and around the world. And so every ribbon that is built um, was traced from her original ribbon, and we asked to build a sense of community by everyone around you. So I've brought a couple tonight that my family built and my team has helped me build. And if anybody is interested, we can either plan a build here uh, with the team at Memorial, or I can have them delivered to you. You just let us know your interest, and thank you for allowing us to be here. Thanks, Thanks.
Um, I want to remind everybody that our originally scheduled living room is coming up on April 16th. It's about improving care delivery. Uh, Dr. Mohan from Stanford is going to be coming and talking about what care delivery looks like um, at Stanford Hospital and what good should look like. So please feel free to join us. We've got some flyers, like I said, if you want to sign in remotely. A huge thank you yet again. A big standing round of applause um, for this fantastic team. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more, and Melanie said it about community with the right ribbon, but um, this team and Memorial have been partnered with GoTo for many, many years now. Not only are they a center of excellence, uh, receiving designations for the quality care that they give to their patients here in the community, but uh, Dr. Reyes and others have chaired our 5K. Thank you to those of you who have come out, and thank you to all of you who have actually come here today uh, to be a part of this community event. We love seeing your faces. Um, I would be remiss at not thanking the Beverly Boys. They got here really early today to set up these cameras, so you folks at home could, um, could watch. Michelle, Michelle Zay, who's my living room partner in crime, who's somewhere in the back there, um, the entire GoTo team for their tireless um, efforts in affecting change in this space. And then, of course, our supporters. I have to put my glasses on for this because the, the list is long. And without them, we wouldn't be able to bring you this type of programming. So Amgen, AstraZeneca, Bayer, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Daichi Sankyo, Isai, Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, Marathi Therapeutics, Novartis, Novacure, Regeneron, Santa Fe, and Takeda. Thank you to all of you for making this possible for our community. Thanks, everybody. Oh, and please get some dessert. If you didn't get dessert or if you got here late and didn't get dinner, I think there's still a ton of food out there. So I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if 